So, like I said, uh, we will be calling it a night tonight and, and finishing up this bloom study. It's been 10 weeks of the names of Jesus that have been such a blessing. I, I can't even tell you all I've learned from it just in the studying. It's been pretty amazing. But uh, I do feel like the Lord wants me to wrap it up tonight. I think this is the perfect last name that we, that we do. We will probably start meeting quarterly for like women's lunches and stuff, and maybe we'll do a couple of names then and just kind of have more interaction with it. Uh, the initial goal was to do it right up until the women's retreat, but then I realized I'm teaching at the women's retreat. I think I need a little study time for this too. <laughs> um, we do have the women's retreat coming up in Clarksville, Georgia. I've got a couple signed up. It's April 22nd through the 24th. I uh, need a head count as soon as we can. If you have any questions or you want to come and you just need to know more, let me know. We're going to get an email out soon and I have all the answers you could possibly need. Well, tonight we're going to be getting into the name of Jesus as friend and how intimate and full of love this name is. So let us begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here tonight. Lord, we are asking that you enter this room, Lord, that you fill this place with your presence, and Lord, that you allow us just to come before your throne and Lord, lay everything down at your at your feet and at the cross and that we are able to walk away knowing you deeper knowing you more lord that we can call you friend and know what it means lord we thank you for your friendship we thank you for the love that you pour out on us every week and lord i thank you for the ladies right here in this room who i do call friends so lord we thank you for every blessing you've poured out and lord i ask that you're with us tonight it's in your name we pray amen so we are going to begin tonight in John 15. We're going to go through verses 9 through 17. So please turn your Bibles with me to John 15. Our text will begin on verse 9. John 15, verse 9. So this is Jesus. He's speaking to his disciples the night before his crucifixion. And he says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no other one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do whatever I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Now in verses 9 and 10, we see Jesus mention the word abide three times. What does abide mean? Do you remember? It means to dwell in or lodge in. In other words, to settle into and make yourself at home right with Jesus. We also know that we are to abide in God's love. And Jesus teaches us how. It's by obeying him. When we fail to abide in Jesus' love, we do not obey him or keep his commandments. Therefore, we don't have all the fullness of joy and life that he promises to those who do abide in him through the love and obedience. Jesus is saying these things to you so that his joy remains in you. The joy of Jesus is about being right with God and walking with a conscious effort in his love and care. We all want to have joy in our life, but we must realize to have this joy is to come to the understanding that in our relationship with the Lord Jesus, it's also a friendship. 
He is our friend. He is a constant presence who is with us always. How many of the times during a day do you pick up the phone and call your closest friends? Me, I love daily talks. Doesn't have to be long, just hey, checking in, and I love you, my friend. And I'm missing that deeply in my life right now. Linda's passing, it hurt. I miss her conversations, but I'm learning through this that I have exactly what I need here and that I have Jesus as my friend. And it's only with Jesus, and he's the one that I'm able to talk to because I can reach out at any time. It doesn't involve a phone or depending on him to pick up the other end of it. It just involves me opening up in prayer, talking to the Lord, and listening for his voice to talk back to me. It happens in so many different ways, too. I've heard Rob say it again and again, and the more I practice, the more real this has become. That as much time as I spend talking to the Lord, I have to listen. I have to be quiet and give him time to talk back to me and show me the things that he wants to show me. And it's hard for me to do because I am a talker. But the more I'm doing it, the more clear I understand that he is talking back and that I'm hearing him. I'm learning to call out to my friend Jesus when I need him or just when I need to talk. Jesus also tells us what the extent of his love is and that we are to abide in him. In John 15, 12, he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So in abiding in him, we love others according to the way that he loved us. He loved us enough to lay down his life for us. He is calling us to love in a way that we are willing to lay down our lives for others. It's sacrificial. It's a sacrificial love, a love that chooses the other person and a love that bears fruit. This means that through friendship, we are to lift one another up, be in wise counsel to one another, encourage our friends to turn to the Lord and to turn to the word for the ability of his spirit to step in and to guide your friends in love. He closes this part of scripture with John 15, 17. These things I command you that you love one another. See, John 15, Jesus is telling us to be a friend to him and what it means. What it means is to have and to share the intimate knowledge of God's love and passion for his people. It's to share in what God is doing and how God is doing it. This is why Jesus could say, you are my friends if you do what I command. And of course, what Jesus commands is love. Friendship of Jesus is both a wonderful gift and a terrible burden. It's an immense joy to be able to share firsthand experiences of God's great love with his people. And yet, it can also be a crushing weight because it is a burden that is hard to explain at times. Perhaps the best analogy is explained by a mother's love. A loving mother suffers with her suffering child. She would put herself last in order to bear the suffering in her child's place, if she could. So as we see, the loving mother suffers more when she sees her child suffering. That's the burden of friends. We suffer with our friends as they suffer. And we would love them sacrificially and would give anything we could to remove their suffering. That's true friendship. Proverbs 18, 24. Proverbs 18, verse 24. Says, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Basic concept, right? If you want friends, be friendly. But there's something in this verse I don't want you to look over. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Human friendships will always have disappointments in them, no matter how hard we try. But Jesus Christ himself calls us no longer slaves, but friends. 
However, let me open up your minds to this, written by Charles Spurgeon. Yes, I love his writing. I'm sorry I quote him a lot, but he's great. <laughs> yeah. He illustrates several questions in this quote. So I'm going to read this extremely slowly so y'all can think about this. Now I have a question to ask. That question I ask of every man and every woman in this place and of every child too. Is Jesus Christ your friend? Have you a friend at court, at heaven's court? Is the judge of quick and dead your friend? Can you say that you love him? And has he ever revealed himself in the way of love to you? Dear hearer, do not answer that question for thy neighbor. Answer it for thyself. Pure peasant, rich or poor, learned or illiterate, this question is for each of you. Therefore, ask it. Is Christ my friend? Is Jesus Christ your friend? Can you say that you love him? And has he ever revealed himself in the way of love to you? Just think about these questions. For me, it was a lot of thought, but the answer is a resounding yes. He is my friend. He has revealed himself through love to me time and time again. Just the simple fact that I'm standing here in Clarksville, Tennessee, married to my best friend here on earth, living a life serving the one who gave his life for me so that I will be with him in eternity. What a total and evident love that he revealed to me in this. Jesus reveals himself to me daily, and I'll tell you what, each time he does show me his love and his mercy and his graces, I grow closer and stronger in my faith with him. I find myself thankful for trials that I'm going through because I know anything that he, I'm going through, he is going to show me what I will be able to learn and how to lean on him and in him through it. He shows me it in his love and his friendship. What is it to be a friend? A true friend. Paul tells us, and if you'll turn to Colossians 3 <clears throat> and follow along with me, Colossians 3, we're going to go through verses 12 through 14. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love which is the bond of perfection. We are Jesus' friends. We are the elect of God, meaning that God has chosen you and me as Christians to be something special in his plan. The word elect is a powerful word that is comforting and that shows that we have a calling to fulfill. It is all about his will and plan for our life. He tells us to put on tender mercies, kindness, humility. These are three qualities that are express themselves in relationships. It's how we treat people, and it'll begin new relationships, and it improves relationships that we're already in. And it will turn them into truly quality friendships. Meekness is about showing humility towards others through your actions. Long-suffering shows how humility will affect your reaction to others. How easy it is to become impatient, short-tempered. How easy is it to be filled with resentment? We're to forgive one another. How hard is this? Seriously, it's hard. <laughs> it's not in our nature. 
I used to be someone that would hold in anger and unforgiveness until I would explode. It would eat at me and eat at me. And then when I felt like something was done to me the wrong way, I would just fester in it. Then it never filled. I would explode. I would bring up things from the past that I had said were forgiven, but I hadn't really forgiven them if I brought them back up, right? I think about this, and I am truly remorseful for the people I've hurt by bringing up things that never should have been brought back up. It hurts when our past is brought up and thrown back in our face. Personally, I'm a different person than I was four years ago, and a much different person than I was 20 years ago. However, when my past has been put back in my face by someone I love or by a friend, it hurts. It hurts deep. And as women, we have to be mindful that we actually let the past be the past and not bring it back up and throw it in someone else's face. Have you been hurt by this before? How does it make you feel? Does it make you question yourself? Because throwing things in someone's face can really cause that person to stumble. And I want you to see that. It could cause them to be reminded of their sin and wrongdoing. And it can cause them to question if God has forgiven them. Is that right for you to do to them? The answer is no. It's not right for us to do this. What we need to do is be loving. We need to be slow to speak and quick to listen. And we need to let the past be the past. We need to be true friends and love like Jesus. We are called to forgive. And if we can just understand the way that Jesus forgives us and keep it in our hearts and our minds, then it will make us much more generous with our forgiving. Just think of everything that you've done wrong. Jesus has forgiven your sin, and he will forgive us even if we sin again. Of course, our purpose should not be to sin again, but honestly, we're human, and we will fall short. And do you know that I've thought about this? When he tells us that he's forgiven us, he doesn't give us a probationary time frame. He simply forgives. And I know I've sinned and I've done things that I knew would be hard, if not impossible, to forgive. Because oftentimes I don't forgive myself. But my friend, my Jesus, he does forgive me. And once he has, he receives me back into fellowship with him. He loves me, and it's unconditional. And we're commanded to love one another in the same manner. John 13, 34 A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. When we're being a friend to someone, we are loving one another. I was someone who always said, I don't have many friends, but I have a few. But my grandfather used to say all the time, if you can count on one hand the number of friends you have, then you're a lucky person. And it's true. If you have one or two friends that are faithful and reliable, it's better than having numerous unreliable friends. Let me ask you this. Are you considered a faithful and reliable friend? Or are you unreliable? And it's a deep question to ask yourself. Being a good friend to someone means making sure that we aren't talking behind their back. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily gossiping, but I will say this. If you're talking about someone else and they're not there to defend themselves or just be a part of the conversation, then you have no business talking about that person. And I have my own convictions with this, and here's why. I remember we were hanging out with some friends of ours in Texas, and the subject of another person was being talked about. But before the conversation started to really get going, our friend Sheila said, if they aren't here to defend themselves, Y'all have no business talking about them. And what I've kept by her statement is two very important things. First, that if you have something to say about someone, it needs to edify the spirit and be something that you would say in front of them. And second, that the person being spoke about may have no idea for a period of time that they're being talked about. However, it will come out one way or another nine times out of ten, and it'll hurt them, 
and no one deserves to be hurt like that. No one's perfect. And the more we get to know people and, you know, like certain people, the more you see their weaknesses and their imperfections. And over time, you may end up having disputes or disagreements and offenses happen. But don't dwell because it will damage your friendship. And from that day on, in the back of my mind, I've kept Sheila's godly counsel. As Peter tells us in uh, 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sin. That's 1 Peter 4, 8. This is actually addressed to the church members, but it covers friendships as well. Jesus calls us to forgive just as he has forgiven us. He promises to forgive people who repent and to cast all of our sin to the depth of the sea, as Micah 7, verses 18 and 19 tells us. Micah 7, verses 18 and 19. So you see, we are treated graciously. We need to be ready to forgive others and not keep discussing or coming back to what they've done wrong or their shortcomings. shortcomings. It doesn't just damage friendships. It will damage relationship with Jesus as well. Are there any offenses that you need to forgive others for? If there is, seek the Lord's forgiveness, and may he reveal to you his heart for you, and may you see his heart for others as he shows you his love for you. Let us be women that are known for loving others. Women who have been born into the world to be God's vessels. Vessels to love just as Jesus loves because he is love. 1 John 4, 7 says it so clearly. That's 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another for God is love and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. I pray that people who know you and call you friend know they are loved. Not only that, but when they talk about you, that they see that you have been born of God and that you know God. Let us be women who will speak with godly counsel from a place in prayer and fellowship with our Lord and our friend, and from the wisdom of his word, his direction, and from his instruction. Tonight, I would like to close with a classic hymn called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what a peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. This hymn was written in 1855 by a preacher's son to comfort his mother whom he had left behind in Ireland when he came to the United States. According to him, Jesus is our friend because he bears our burdens and sorrows. The hymnist wrote this to assure his mother that though he couldn't be there with her, Jesus is with her, and he is a friend like no other. He asked, can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? There is no better friend than Jesus. And to hear him call me friend makes me desire more and more of him. It draws me closer and closer. Jesus says to his disciples who were together with him in the upper room, I no longer call you servants because servants do not know their master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. Tonight, my friends, I want you to take a deep breath and hear that the Lord is calling you friend. He is calling you friend. He loves you. He wants you to draw close to him and he, as he draws close to you. Charles Spurgeon again quotes, If you be a Christian, be a Christian. 
and be marked and a distinct one. Let me take this one step further. If you are a Christian, be a Christian and be marked and distinct as one who loves. I love you, my friends, but even more so, Jesus loves you. He called you his friend. He is our friend. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, our friend, thank you so much for all you do. Thank you for everything you've done. And thank you for the intimacy of the relationship and just the ability to call you friend. Thank you for the people and the godly people that come into our lives and that we're able to be friends with, that we can lift up and that we are reminded just to love and reminded what love truly is. Lord, let us be women that can walk out and make friends with anyone because they know the love of Jesus comes through us and from us. Lord, allow us to walk in your will and in your path that you have directed for us. Lord, teach us and make us and mold us. We love you so very much, and I'm so thankful for tonight. It's in your holy and precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Molly, would you mind closing us tonight with this hymn? Thank you. Mm-hmm.